Well, that was like amazing. That was really good. <laughs> I just finished watching the Xbox event, the Xbox and Starfield dual event, and uh, I'm just like blown away by it, honestly. I, I think it was really, really, really strong. I find that every year, you know, when we're in like the E3 zone, there's always a situation where you find that you don't realize how like okay events have been until you watch a really good one. And that's exactly what happened here. Xbox had just like a really, really stellar showing today, I think, um, that painted a pretty good picture for 2023 and like an amazing picture for 2024. Because most of the stuff that, that was announced today is releasing next year straight to Game Pass. And I think that's like kind of the story of this is like, Xbox, as I've mentioned many times on this show and into the Aether and elsewhere, Xbox is in this weird spot where I think a lot of people are like, okay, you acquired all of these studios. Where are those games at? Um, and I, I, I think just people are like kind of getting antsy for that stuff to start dropping. And although it's not happening this year, it looks like a lot of it is starting to happen next year. We saw a lot of announcements from some of the recently acquired studios uh, with early 2024 dates. But I think more interestingly, considering Game Pass specifically is the focus for Microsoft, one of the coolest things in my eyes is that it seems like they're getting really aggressive about getting third party studios on board with Game Pass. So a lot of stuff that I think would have come to Game Pass, you know, six, eight, 12 months down the line is coming straight to Game Pass now. Um, and that's really cool. So again, like the past couple days, I'm not gonna go through everything that got announced today, but I will go through most things. So let's do it. Also, if you're new here, hi, my name is Brendan Bigley. This is Wavelengths, it's a show about video game news. Uh, I've been making episodes pretty much daily <laughs> about all of the events because every single day there's been something interesting to talk about. But Wavelengths is a podcast where I will only make episodes when there is interesting video game news to talk about. And uh, boy, that's been happening a lot. And specifically when covering these events, my approach has been like, I'll talk about the stuff that I thought was interesting. If there's stuff that like didn't really pique my curiosity uh, or interest, then I probably won't bring it to my recaps. Um, the Xbox event, there's not a lot of stuff that I didn't find interesting. So there's a lot to talk about. I've kind of broken it up. I'm not going to go through it all in order, but I've kind of broken it up in, in segments, I think. Um, starting with the first three announcements, which was like the opening block, I think, uh, which was a really kind of smart way to do it because it was three kind of heavy hitters. But the first thing that we saw was Fable, which, you know, rumored back and forth for the past couple of weeks if it was even going to show up at this event. And Thankfully, it did. We don't have a date on it yet, which is a little bit of a bummer, but it was a really interesting like blend of what I think was a cinematic trailer and also some gameplay. It really did look like there was some gameplay mixed in there. Um, go watch it again. Tell me if I'm wrong in the comments, but it, it seemed like we saw uh, Richard Ayade from uh, from the IT crowd show up, just kind of give like a monologue to camera that was just like a, a goofy thing, very much in the in the vein of like normal fable humor. Um, but then it was revealed at a certain point that he is in fact a giant, and that there is like a hero that showed up at his door, and uh, he tries to then kill this little hero. It was fun. It was fun. I mean, it, it was Fable. You know, it felt like Fable, and I think that's kind of the most you can ask for uh, outside of when is it coming out, which we still don't know the answer to. But, you know, even just seeing Fable was exciting, just knowing it's still coming down the line, I guess, is nice. They didn't cancel it. We know that. That was followed by South of Midnight, which is a new game by Compulsion Games, who made We Happy Few. I've been really wondering what's going on with that studio and where they're going next after We Happy Few, because I feel like that was a game that showed really well when it was first announced, came out, some people liked it, some people found it underwhelming, didn't really make the biggest splash in the world, I think. Um, but it was very clear, at least based on the art direction of We Happy Few, that that game's studio has just so much talent back there. So I've been really looking forward to what it was coming next. South of Midnight, another situation where we like don't quite know what that game is. It just looks really cool, and that's exciting. Following that was another like totally cinematic trailer from Massive Games, the studio that makes The Division, working with Lucasfilm Games on a game called Star Wars Outlaws. It's coming out in 2024. We didn't see any gameplay. We're going to see some gameplay at Ubisoft Forward uh, in a couple days. I forget when that is, but I think that's pretty soon. Maybe it's even tomorrow now that I think about it. I think those three announcements were like kind of a splashy way to start the show. Uh, even if we didn't see a lot of gameplay, we, even though we didn't hypothetically see any gameplay, still three games that like 
showed really well, looked really good, um, and just like a cool way of opening the show. I'm really excited to see what Star Wars Outlaws is all about, actually. Massive games. I, I like The Division and The Division 2 a lot. I didn't really get like into them, into them, because they came out while Destiny was really like the game I was playing. Um, but the idea of giving them the Star Wars license and letting them make something like The Division in the world of Star Wars is really exciting. But even if it isn't that, like that's kind of what I'm expecting. But even if it isn't that, that's... I'm just still like excited to see that studio uh, take on Star Wars. That'll be really fun. The next block I definitely have to talk about is the Persona stuff, because uh, Persona 3 Reload officially got announced. It was the same trailer that leaked the other day. Um, it was funny to see the like world premiere thing show up, and then it was like, oh yeah, we've all seen this already. Um, it's coming early 2024. Still looks really good. Coming straight to Game Pass, which is exciting. I think we know also, since the leak has happened, that it's coming to like Switch and PlayStation and PC. Um, so you can really play it anywhere, but it going straight to Game Pass is really smart. Quick, like, unbelievable update, but apparently IGN has done an interview with the uh, lead producer and chief director of Persona 3 Reload, and they have confirmed that there is no content from Persona 3 Fez or Persona 3 Portable present in Persona 3 Reload. Uh, they said, quote, I'd like to mention that since the basic concept of the Persona 3 remake was the remake Persona 3, we don't have the Fez and Portable contents included. We wanted to really genuinely work on recreating the Persona 3 experience. They go on to say that they have new voice actors and new music and they've remade everything from scratch and that's cool, but it just it just feels like a huge missed opportunity. I'm, I'm just like blown away that this was the decision. All right, back to the rest of the, the event. Persona 5 Tactica is the other game that leaked. It's Persona 5 meets Fire Emblem with like a kind of chibi art style and that's going to work for some people. I don't know how well it works for me, even as like a fan of Persona and a fan of Persona 5 specifically. Like, I don't know how well it works for me, but if it comes out and I'll have a bunch of friends who will play it and if they tell me it's good, then I'll probably end up playing it. It's another one coming straight to Game Pass, which is uh, wild. It's coming this year, November 17th. Looking forward to it. But the big one, the big one, from Atlas. A couple years ago, we saw this artwork for a thing that was called Project RE Fantasy that was by the studio that made, uh, the studio within Atlas specifically, that made Personas 3, 4, and 5. Um, and honestly, just that one piece of artwork was like enough for me to get really excited about it. Just the idea of the Persona team making something that was like high fantasy was really cool. Uh, and we finally got to see what that is today. It's called Metaphor Re Fantasio. I'm definitely pronouncing that in the worst way possible with like maybe even a New Jersey accent, but I'm just like amped about this. I mean, it, it just looks like really maximalist, really high fantasy also has elements of the real world in it. Um, I don't, it looks exhilarating. It's coming out early next year also. I mean, that's like, that's going to be so cool. I, I don't even really need to know anything else about it. I'm just going to like get it when it comes out. It looks stylish as hell. It looks like so sick. The next block of stuff I want to talk about are some things that are coming like soon, like this year at least. Uh, the first one was the Rare logo showed up on screen, and I got really hyped because I thought this was going to be ever wild. Because I think it was either last year's Xbox event or maybe the year before that, we saw a little bit of this game that Rare was working on called Everwild, and it's just been like radio silence ever since. Um, every time Rare shows up in the news, ever since then, it's like more Sea of Thieves stuff. Uh, so seeing the Rare logo is like, oh man, is this going to be it? And then the Lucasfilm logo showed up, and I was like, okay, definitely not Everwild, but what on earth could this be? What Lucasfilm property would cross over with Sea of Thieves in a way that like makes sense at all? And then the light bulb went off. It's like, oh man, this might be Monkey Island, which is such a natural fit. It's like such an obvious idea. And it looks so cute. That's what it is. It's 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 a crossover between Sea of Thieves and Monkey Island. It's coming July 20th, so like really soon. Um, it just looks great. I'm not a person who plays Sea of Thieves a lot. I jump in every once in a while when like my friends and I remember it exists and we're like, hey, do you want to download Sea of Thieves off Game Pass and like hop in for a little bit? And we always have a really good time. Um, but this looks like a really kind of narrative focused event uh, happening with Monkey Island. So cool idea. Forza Motorsport is coming on October 10th. It looks good. It looks like Forza. I mean, you know, I, I feel like weirdly um, Forza Horizon has started to take the spotlight of the franchise weirdly, despite being a spinoff. But Forza Motorsport is still like an exciting prospect. And the fact that it's coming straight to Game Pass is cool. I'm a person who like kind of gets into racing games every once in a while. I did play the most recent Gran Turismo, for example. Obviously, Forza Horizon is a huge thing. Um, but that having been said, I haven't played a Forza Motorsport, like just straight up Forza Motorsport, I think since the Xbox 360. Uh, so this will be the first one I play in a really long time, and I'm kind of excited to check it out. City Skylines 2 had a trailer. 
there's really not a lot you have to say about City Skylines 2 outside of like, did you like City Skylines? Because that game was kind of a miracle. Guess what? It looks even better in like almost every way somehow this time. Um, and this time it's coming straight to console and straight to Game Pass October 24th. That's kind of what I'm talking about. It's like, okay, here you have another third party studio that's releasing a game straight to Game Pass um, this year. And that's that's really exciting. Um I'm also just excited because City Skylines, I liked a lot when it first came out. I tried playing. It was like the last game I downloaded on my dead and dying gaming laptop before I had to retire it forever. Uh, and it really just like, it couldn't handle that game. And then years later, it came to console and that was cool. But at that point, I was like, I don't know if I need to play City Skylines again. Uh, but this one launching on console is really cool. And I'm really excited to get my hands on it. Um, although maybe I'll just play that on the Steam Deck. But it'll probably look better on my Xbox, right? I don't know. We'll figure it out. October 28th. We'll figure it out. All right. This next box is a bunch of stuff I'm just really excited about. Most of it launching in 2024. Um, some of it I'm actually surprised is launching in 2024. The first one being Avowed, which is a game that I think, you know, we all were expecting to show up or maybe even just hoping to show up. Maybe not expecting, but hoping was going to show up. If you don't know Avowed, um, weird, weird story with Avowed, but it's by Obsidian Entertainment, who I would guess when they greenlit that game, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I would guess when they greenlit that game, there was a little bit of like, a, why isn't anyone else trying to make Elder Scrolls besides Bethesda? Because Bethesda's on this cycle where they make Elder Scrolls and they make Fallout and now they make Starfield. So they have these like three pillars that they cycle between. So like a up next after Starfield is going to be the next Elder Scrolls and then probably Fallout and then another Starfield and so on and so on and so on, maybe forever. Um, but that leaves a huge gap. I mean, it's been so long since Skyrim came out and no one has really like served that audience specifically. Um, and it seemed like Obsidian wanted to do it when they made a vow. That having been said, Obsidian got acquired by Microsoft. So now weirdly enough, Avowed is a Microsoft property and Elder Scrolls is a Microsoft property. So when Avowed got announced, I was like, okay, I get two different kinds of Elder Scrolls games. That's exciting for me as a big fan of the Elder Scrolls. And this was the first time that we saw some like real gameplay, a bunch of like cinematic stuff, but like specifically, what is it going to look like to play Avowed? And uh, it looks, <laughs> surprise, surprise, it looks like Elder Scrolls. A little bit edgier, I'd say. Um, there seems to be some kind of like morality system. Uh, there's like a big like Forge Your Destiny thing that going on with this game. I, th I think I'm excited about it. I was excited. I was really excited about it when they announced it. And weirdly enough, this trailer cooled me on it a little bit. I think just because it had a little bit of like, I'll say 2013 kind of edgelord vibes to it. Um, but, you know, I'll reserve my judgment really until it comes out. Avowed is still a game that I'm like really keeping my eye on. It's coming out in 2024. Again, straight to Game Pass. So after that, I was really surprised to find that uh, they're making a Microsoft Flight Simulator 2024 specifically. So Microsoft Flight Simulator, old franchise from Microsoft, obviously, uh, started in the 90s, went, you know, every couple of years, they would have a new one for a while. But just recently, there was a Microsoft Flight Simulator, no date attached to it. Uh, and I really thought that that was going to be a live service. That's what it seemed like to me, at least. It seemed like Microsoft Flight Simulator was built to be a live service that they would just continue to add more and more stuff to forever. So when they announced a bunch of new stuff coming to Microsoft Flight Simulator. Uh, they, they said it was the next generation of Flight Simulator, and they showed like a bunch of emergency response missions that you could do. There was stuff like uh, you could be a VIP charter service. You could do air racing, scientific research, fly hot air balloons uh, above, you know, like a bunch of migrating wildebeest. There was a lot of cool stuff going on. I was just expecting this to be a really big update to Flight Simulator. And then it said Microsoft Flight Simulator 2024. And I think that's kind of weird, but whatever. I mean, I'll still, I'll still check it out. If you haven't played Microsoft Flight Simulator, it's like the biggest file you can download on your Xbox. So maybe not the move. But uh, if you are okay with clearing everything else off your Xbox or just playing it through xCloud, which is, I think, maybe the most efficient way to play it now that I think about it, it's a miracle of a video game, I think. And is worth experiencing at least once. Just like go through the flight training stuff and just experience what it's like to play that game and uh, ask yourself if there's a world in which you could have ever been someone where Microsoft Flight Simulator is the only game you play. Because those people are out there and they're having the time of their lives. And boy, do I wish I could be one of them. But I'm not, unfortunately. Because I have other things to play, like Like a Dragon, Infinite Wealth, which is like maybe the best trailer for a video game I've seen all week. 
We got Ichiban, who was the protagonist of Like a Dragon 7, uh, waking up nude on a beach in what looked like Hawaii with no memory of how he got there or why he's naked on the beach. I mean, look, I don't need to get any more information about this game. Like, if you're just telling me that there's a new Like a Dragon coming out, I'm going to play it. And that's uh, kind of it. It's coming early 2024. So exhilarating. Infinite Wealth, great name, by the way. Really good name. Oh, also the infinity sign is an eight turned sideways. So that explains... I was wondering why it wasn't called Like a Dragon 8 Infinite Wealth, but I guess the infinite sign is kind of an 8. Path of the Goddess is a new game coming from Capcom, and as I talk about here all the time, we talk about On Into the Aether all the time. Capcom is just in this, like, renaissance, and it's another situation where, like, if a Capcom logo shows up, I will play the game, I will check it out, I will be excited about it, because it really seems like they can do no wrong at the moment. It just looks beautiful. It's just, like, kind of a a beautiful hack and slash. It looks like you're fighting a bunch of yokai. Uh, It's, like, really vibrant. It's almost maximalist in a way that I I think is... uh, kind of interesting. I, I I had a hard time reading what was happening on screen, but that almost makes it more enticing to me uh, that they would stick to that art style, knowing how like wild and maybe overwhelming it is. It looks cool. The next announcement is not one that I'm personally excited for, but I just have to talk about because it's really confusing. Overwatch 2 showed a cinematic that introduced a bunch of new game modes, hypothetically. Um, it looked like they're adding PvE and a bunch of story-specific stuff, despite having announced recently that they're removing the PvE content from the timeline of, of releases for Overwatch 2. Um, Overwatch 2 is a really confusing thing. It launched in a state that people weren't very happy with, uh, specifically removing the PvE, which was the whole reason that game got greenlit in the first place. So to publicly be like, hey, there's going to be no PvE, and then show off this, maybe I just misunderstood what I was looking at in this trailer, but... It just seems like the kind of thing where if you if you wanted if you wanted that announcement of removing the PVE to go even remotely okay, why would you withhold all of this information, especially considering we're going to be learning about it really soon? It said a new adventure begins August 10th. So it's like pretty soon. Um it's just really confusing, really confusing. I I have bailed on Overwatch 2 at this point. I probably will not go back to it if I'm being honest with myself. Um but I'm hopeful that the people who are still playing Overwatch will be excited about this. They need a win, those Overwatch fans. You know what I mean? Man, next game, really excited about. I, I don't really know a whole lot about it. It's called Dungeons of Hinterberg. Uh, I mean, you're snowboarding on a sword. This art looks amazing. It has kind of Zelda energy. It just looks so beautiful. It, 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 I, I, love, I love the look of it. I am really excited. It's coming out in 2024. It's coming to Game Pass. I wish I knew more about it. Um, if you're watching the video version of this, you're seeing what it looks like right now. Stunning video game. Towerborn is another 2024 game that's coming straight to Game Pass. Uh, it's a co-op hack and slash game. It was implied to me, at least based on what I was seeing, that a lot of it's going to be procedurally generated, which I think is exciting. Um, I don't know if it's like a co-op roguelike per se, but looks really, really cool. The thing about Towerborn that really stuck out to me, besides just like really vibrant and beautiful art, is the the vibe I was getting from it was like, a modern day Castle Crashers. And if you haven't played Castle Crashers with a bunch of people on the internet, you should probably do that. But there was an era during the Xbox Live Arcade era where like all my friends and I did was play Castle Crashers all the time. It's like, it was just a game we like couldn't put down for the life of us. Um, And I've been really itching to get a game like that in my life again. And Towerborn looks like it might actually be it. Um, So again, 2024 straight to Game Pass. And I honestly think for games that are uh, online co-op focused or even just multiplayer focused in general uh, coming straight to Game Pass is a real a real win usually. The last game I want to shout out just because I again I thought it was kind of confusing and I, I'm, I'm trying to reserve judgment a little bit but it's Clockwork Revolution it looks so much like Bioshock Infinite like the art direction is almost exactly the same um, it has no date it's coming to Game Pass but it has this mechanic where you can go back in time and change things in the past that will change the future. Jumping back and forth hypothetically, I guess would change the way the story is being told. I'm not really sure if that's even true. Um, It just looks so much like Bioshock Infinite, enough so that when it was announced, I was like, is this the new Bioshock? Isn't it weird that they're going back to the world of of Columbia in the sky? that game, Bioshock Infinite, has so much baggage associated with it that I'm like, I'm amazed that A, it's not Bioshock, but I'm amazed that B, another studio would be like, yeah, let's let's use that art style specifically. Um, again, I don't want to be too mean. I want to reserve judgment a little bit. If you're excited about it, stay excited about it. But um, I just, I need to see so much more of this game before I'm even willing to like be on board with this.
Before I even get into Starfield, I do want to mention that there was a hardware announcement, or actually a couple hardware announcements, but the big one, I think, in my eyes, was Phil Spencer gets on stage, and he specifically is like, for those of you who have the Xbox Series S but wish it had more storage, we have something for you. There was a Starfield external hard drive that they made in collaboration with Seagate, and I was sure that's what this announcement was going to be, but no, it's the Xbox Series S, but this time it's in black. And it's 349, and it comes out on September 1st. I guess that's exciting. I mean... It doesn't help me, somebody with a Series S who doesn't have enough storage, um, and I really don't want to spend like the hundred fifty dollars on the like external memory card you can plug into the back. So I was kind of hoping for maybe something different. But if you don't have a Series S, I guess this is a good idea. I don't even know. I do, I really don't know how I feel about this. Uh, Three forty nine is like just past the limit of like hey, everyone should get this. Like, if you are a person who doesn't have an Xbox, the Series S is such an easy on-ramp. Being $299, frequently on sale for less than that, I just feel like is a no-brainer. Like, if you're interested in Microsoft stuff or Xbox at all, if you're interested in Game Pass and you want to try it out, um, it's like a no-brainer way of getting in on that. But that having been said, as soon as you bump it into the, like, 300 right when it's, like, $350... I just don't know if it becomes like the no-brainer thing that the Xbox Series S was meant to be originally. Also, and maybe this is a hot take, but I think the Series S looks amazing. The like the white box with the big like black fan uh, vent looks amazing. Like it's like my favorite piece of gaming hardware that I own. Legitimately, I think it looks incredible. Um, and uh, the all black edition is like, eh, I don't know. Kind of takes away a little bit of the charm of the Series S, I think. That having been said, though, I'm probably going to upgrade to a Series X. I think for Starfield specifically. So should we talk about Starfield? Yeah, I think we should. I will say about Starfield before we even get into it that uh, I am a huge fan of Bethesda open world games. Even like Fallout 4, which was a game that a lot of people have a lot of problems with. I, I loved Fallout 4. I didn't, you know, I didn't finish it, but I played a lot of it. But like Oblivion and Skyrim are just like formative games in my brain. Not in my life, just like in my brain. I feel like the chemical makeup of my brain a piece of it is reserved for Bethesda open world RPGs. So hearing forever, forever, it's been so long since Todd Howard first like uttered, yeah, we really want to make like a space game. That's been so exciting to me. And over the years, it's gone through so many different iterations in my head, so many different variants of what that kind of game could be. Um, and I, I think the vision that was always in my head was more Star Trek than what we're getting. I think this showcase, having a, a showcase specifically uh, highlighting all of the different systems, all the different like ideas and, and the thought behind those ideas for Starfield was really, really, really cool. It was a really nice thing to have such a deep dive into a game specifically. It's a thing I always miss uh, or I have missed over the past couple of years about some of these like all digital events as I found that like during E3 conferences, especially when like EA and Ubisoft were doing their own conferences, you would frequently get these really deep dives into games. And it was really nice to see that for Starfield specifically, because even though I'm fully on board, I know a lot of people in my life who aren't. There are a lot of people I know who are, like need a lot more of a push to get excited about Starfield. I didn't need that. So I just spent most of this time going, oh my God, out loud over and over and over again for like almost an entire hour. I will say uh, on the outset, it really does look like Bethesda's No Man's Sky. And there are a lot of ways in which I think this game could be what people thought No Man's Sky was going to be. That's not to say No Man's Sky is bad or even was bad. I'll be honest. Like, I really liked No Man's Sky when it first came out. I think it had a lot of issues, obviously. I mean, when the studio itself is apologizing for the issues, you know there are issues. But even when it came out, judging the game by what it was, not what I was expecting it to be... It was a really great game to like throw on a podcast and just fly around space and just explore stuff. And yeah, you would see a lot of the same stuff over and over again. And the game loop was a little bit simplistic compared to what it is now, definitely. But I still found the the vibe of like, I'm out here. It's just me. Space is so vast and it's been procedurally generated in a way that makes it so like I might be the only person who ever sees this planet. That was really exciting in No Man's Sky. But Starfield, I've been really curious how they were going to recapture that same scope of a game where you could explore an entire galaxy, look at all these different star systems and the planets within those star systems, um, but also have that kind of like handcrafted Bethesda open world approach. Because say what you will about games like Oblivion, which have these like really open spaces that are a little like cut and pasty, or Skyrim, which has, again, big open spaces, but like 
has some really handcrafted experiences, like the cities are really dense and really interesting, or Fallout 4, which I think, you know, takes that to another level. How do you do that? How do, how do you create really dense handcrafted experiences and environments when you're making what they say and claim to be over a thousand planets? Because that just seems like overwhelming and also seems like something that uh, they should never have any team working on. And the solution that they came up with, I think is actually really elegant. So the worlds are, for the most part, procedurally generated, which is kind of wild. Uh, I, I think what they said was as you fly into a planet, the game is generating that world for you. But part of that world generation also includes big handcrafted like events and environmental storytelling moments. So even though the world might be generated procedurally as you're flying down to it, there might be an entire quest line that will generate itself on that planet because the game has just decided like, okay, let's pick from all these different things that we can choose from that you can experience on this world. And we've decided, yes, we're going to put that on this planet for you. And that's a cool idea. That's a cool concept because it means that you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get the no man's sky of like, no one knows what's here and that's cool. But you also get the really dense storytelling craft of Bethesda alongside that. I think one of the biggest questions I keep asking myself about Starfield is like, why does it need to be this big? You know, I, I think as an industry, it feels like we're starting to get away from open world games being the biggest world we've ever put in a video game. And here comes Starfield being like, we put a thousand worlds in this video game. And I just think that might be like too much for people, but specifically knowing that they went into this experience and they went into this development telling themselves from the outset, we want to make sure this feels like a Bethesda open world RPG and we want you to have those like really cool quest lines that you just kind of stumble upon. We want the explorable spaces. We want the, you know, billion items you can pick up and put in your inventory that can weigh you down over time. I think that's really smart. I wrote down about a billion things to talk about uh, from this game, and I really shouldn't go over all of it. Uh, you should just go watch the, the direct because it was amazing. But a couple highlights that I just think were great. Uh, first of all, the art director described the art direction of this game as NASA punk, which uh, I thought was really funny at first. But when he described it, I was like, oh, yeah, I kind of get where you're coming from. And it's just this really stark contrast between like retro and futuristic. Not retro future, but retro NASA stuff. So like the Apollo missions, but also futuristic. It has this like really great uh, dichotomy between digital and analog technology that makes things feel really lived in. And you're seeing that in some of the ship design and the suit design and things like that. But where I really think that that just like launches into the stratosphere, no pun intended, is the worlds that they showed off. So there's New Atlantis, which is the city, the main city that you will visit throughout the course of the game um, that we've seen in previous Starfield events. But they showed off a couple other cities. They were like, there, New Atlantis is not the only city because that'd be weird if there was only one city in the whole galaxy. But they showed off a couple other cities. One of them is like a space western city that has like kind of firefly energy. There's another one uh, that really looks like a cyberpunk. They called it a, a pleasure city. Um, and I think I think it's really a good sign that they feel like they've crafted a world in Starfield that can support all of those different kinds of art styles and ideas. The idea that flying between a place called New Atlantis, which is like so Star Trek, so futuristic, to a world uh, that has kind of like a Star Wars vibe to another one that feels like Cyberpunk 2077, like all of that being in the same space says to me that they're really confident in the story that they're telling. A lot of the other stuff they announced feels like kind of table stakes for what you would expect from a from a spaceship game like this. For example, you can buy and upgrade your spaceship. Um, it seems like a really, really like rich and deep ship creation and customization experience. So like you can go to any port uh, in space and like buy a ship, but you can also upgrade it and add a bunch of different modules to it. And they showed some wild stuff. I think the wildest one was they sh they showed a ship that was built to look like Optimus Prime, um, which like seems really unwieldy, but you could do it if you want to. But with that also got into like, depending on how you build this ship will impact the stats of that ship. So if you're a bounty hunter, if you're playing this game as a bounty hunter and you're going and searching for people around the galaxy, having a small, lightweight, fast ship is going to be in your best interest. But if you're a person who just wants to play like EVE Online and just shuttle cargo, you can also just build a cargo ship. But they also implied that you could be smuggling as well. So it seems like there's a lot of customization going on on the ship end. You can also customize your character in a pretty deep way. Uh, the character customization looks, you know, it looks like a Bethesda character customizer, but at the end of all of that customization in terms of like face and hair and all that kind of stuff, um, 
they showed that you could choose your background, like your story, not so unlike Mass Effect, it seems like, um, which will give you a bunch of skills, but also you can add a bunch of traits, which are both pros and cons uh, that are bundled together that you can add to yourself. Like one of them they showed off that made me lose my mind was uh, the ability to just be famous. So like fame can be a trait. And uh, because this person was famous, they showed off, amazing that they showed this off in, in the in the direct because they like know their audience so well but they showed off the adoring fan from oblivion making a return in this game they're after my heart and they got it they, they won my heart with that one shout out to todd so you can customize your ship you can customize yourself you can also customize your crew like if you have enough uh space on your ship you can bring on a larger crew and you can go find crewmates from people on quest lines but you can also find crewmates from like just randomly stumbling upon them uh, on a planet you can build an outpost if you really like a planet you can like build a little outpost there for like research or whatever and you can take all of your crewmates and you can assign them to either work on your ship or work in these outposts and based on their own traits because all of these, they, they said all of these characters were also created in the character creator based on their traits that will allow them to work better on a ship or work better in an outpost or work better on this specific outpost with this specific plant life or whatever. Um, it just seems like there's so much density in character expression and, and the kinds of storytelling, the kind of emergent storytelling that you're going to do uh, as you explore the galaxy. I'm just so on board, man. Like, put me in, coach. I, I want to play this game so bad. I... I'm gonna get a Series X for this. Um, they also announced. They also announced a watch. You can get the, so they have like a Pip Boy kind of thing in this game. Uh, it's a watch, but you can buy the real watch in real life in uh, like the top tier collector's edition. That sure is three hundred dollars. Um, I was like, man, I'm gonna get this. I'm gonna get the Starfield watch, and then I saw a three hundred dollar price tag, and uh, absolutely not. Oh, also the game has photo mode. That's important for me. Maybe, maybe for you too, but that's really important for me. <laughs> oh yeah, there's also a controller. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of Starfield branded stuff. They think this is going to be a huge deal. And honestly, I hope it is for my own sake as a person who likes Bethesda games. But that's it. That's it for this event. Uh, I kind of flew through it. If there's anything that you really were interested in that uh, I didn't shout out, let me know in the comments. If you like this show, like, comment, subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That'd be really nice. I didn't talk about Hellblade. Hellblade 2 is coming. I didn't really play the first one. I should probably do that, right? Let me know how much I should play Hellblade. <laughs> All right, I should probably go. That was a good event. It was a really good event. Uh, later tonight, there's going to be a Final Fantasy 16 event also, which I'm really excited about. By the time this is out, it'll probably have happened. Uh, but the rumor is that there's going to be a demo, a playable demo, Final Fantasy 16. So you better bet that I'm going to be playing that. And then we have a bunch more events. Capcom, RGG has some stuff about all their Like a Dragon games. It still continues. Oh, also, I'll just end this by saying this is my third episode of this show that I've done three days in a row. Um, I really appreciate how much people have been uh, chiming in and saying that they like it. Uh, really means a lot. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I love you. Bye-bye.